thank you very much for asking me to come and, uh, and speak to you. I, um, I speak about political developments in South Africa, so I know many of you are scared to think I'm going to talk about Uganda. <laughs> it's okay. No, I'm not to be scared. Um, but I, I, I thought before, um, I was asked to, to paint a picture of, uh, of what uh, people like yourselves, uh, entrepreneurs, leaders in business, um, you know, what kind of legislative, what kind of political issues are likely to come up over the next two, three years that would have an impact on your businesses. And I, I always find it very, very um, interesting to, to talk to people about business because many, many, many business leaders don't think uh, politics affects them. I think, I think politics does. So, um, I thought I'd speak to you about that, but before I do that, I thought that I'd speak to you about this young man. Um, he's my hero. When, when people ask me, who do you admire? I say, this guy. His name is Pixley Kaisa Kassim. He was born in 1881 in Azumina Town. He's an amazing, amazing human being. Um, he went to school in KZN. Um, um, he went to a local missionary school run by a priest called uh, Father Pixley. Um, and at about age 14, 15, he said to Father Pixley, thank you very much for, you know, teaching me and doing all this, but I, I think I'm done here. I want, to, I, want to be, uh, I want to get a degree like you. And this guy said, you're in Kwazulu Natal. This is the 1890s. You're in Kwazulu Natal. What are you going to do? I mean, what do you think? Who do you think you are? He said, no, I really, I want to go to university and I'm going to do it. So, um, with the help of Father Pixley, he manages to get, um, he starts writing to uh, priests and foundations in the U.S. and he gets, uh, he gets a scholarship. Someone says, come to the States and, um, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. And what does he do? He gets on a boat, gets to America, uh, goes to Columbia University. Columbia University tells him, sorry, you don't have a metric, the equivalent of a metric at the time. And so, and so what, happens, um, what happens is that they say, no, you can't get into Columbia University. He says, fine. I'll come back with a metric. So he finds himself a school. He goes to a school called Mount Hermon School in Connecticut. And um, he gets a metric. So he goes back to Columbia and says, Ta-da, there it is. I'm getting in. And he gets into Columbia University. This is in the early 1900s. Um, by 1905, he got his uh, BA from Columbia. And he writes home to his mother, <coughs> his uh, and Father Pixley and says, thanks guys for, you know, helping me to get here. I'm not coming home. Bye-bye. I'm going to the best university in the world. And at the time, the best university in the world was uh, supposedly Oxford University in the UK. So he starts writing letters again, just before he made so he and so he starts writing letters again. And what does he do? Um, he manages to get accepted to Oxford University to study law. And uh, he gets scholarships to take him there. So before you know it, he's on a boat again. He gets to England, does two years of law, um, passes with flying colors from Oxford University, and uh, writes to his mother again. So, Mom, Father Pixley, thanks so much for helping me. I'm not coming home, sorry. I'm just going to um, sit for the bar exams here in the UK. So he sits for the bar exam, and what do you know? He passes flying colors. And then he says, man, I'm going home. He gets home, it's 1910, and he looks around and says, gee, South Africa is changing politically, uh, it's the union of 1910, and he says, so why are the black people, why are they uniting, why are the Zulus fighting the Tossas and the Kossas, the Sotos, and so forth? He says, it's time to start an organization that will unite black people and fight for their rights. And what does he do? He sits down. This guy likes fighting. Man, I, you know, he shouldn't have... Uh, if he was around today, he would have written so many emails. Anyway, so he starts writing all these letters to all these chiefs, saying, I want you guys to come and meet um, in Bloemfontein on the 12th of January, 1912. That's millions, with hundreds of letters. And what do you know? In 1912, in Bloemfontein on January 12th, all these people come together and form an organization called the ANC. And that was Pixley Kaisa Kassim. He was 31 years old. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And that's this guy. That's my guy. 
so a 31 years old, he starts an organization that's, 100, uh, that's now 102 years old, um, which has been responsible for so many amazing, beautiful, gorgeous things in this country. And, uh, and that's the guy I really want to talk to you about. But you know, I know that's not what I was asked to come and talk about. So I'll talk to you about the things you want me to talk about. <laughs> Which are many. <laughs> you guys, you guys are long-term thinkers. You know. I, I really, I would have to ask you. Long-term doesn't mean six days. <laughs> six days doesn't cut it. You have to really, if you're going to work with DHL and really go for it, you know. What's my plan for 2020? I think six days. No, please, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, I just want to say, it's election time. And election time is interesting because we all talk. Everyone, you know, everyone sees a microphone and they grab it, and they want to use it because, you know, it's election time. So for many, many people in this room, many people who work for you, who work with you, who work around you, um, when they see all this noise, because right now it's very noisy, you look at the front pages of the newspapers, it's this and that and that and that. I, I want to help you. Don't be depressed about this stuff. There is a way that can help all of you to look at politics. The way I look at politics, people say, gee, Justice, you must be so cynical because, oh, the politicians are doing this and so forth. And I say, no, 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 no. You need to be careful about politics. You need to read politics properly. And how do you do that? We all get into the noise of politics. So at the moment, because there's an election coming up, we're all running around saying, oh, no, no, it's the end of the world. This is the end of the world. This. For me, when I see politicians doing what's happening right now and that's making a lot of noise, I say, that's fantastic. This is what I wanted in 1994 when we started South Africa. We wanted every five years we knew the elections, there'd be a lot of noise, and that's fantastic. When I see all this stuff happening, I say, yeah, go for it. But what I do think all of us in this room need to be careful and to worry about when we see it, are the institutions of South Africa, do the institutions work? Can you put in a tender, and that tender is adjudicated fairly, and your competitor gets it because they have all the things that are needed to get that tender. The institutions need to work. So for me, the key thing here is the institutions, not, not, the, not, not the noise of politics, the substantive stuff. The institutions need to work. So let's take, for example, um, um, don't, don't go for the noise, as I always say. The noise will always be there. The noise is here right now. And you know, politicians are going to change their minds very quickly. So if you follow the noise, you're going to end up thinking, oh, I was with you here, uh, and now, oh, you're there. <laughs> you follow the substance. The substance is this. The substance is that, you know, do the police work. Uh, many of you here are young people. I can see some of you are nodding off. You probably went to a nice lab last night. The key thing, is this, if you had really, really gone for it last night, and you ended up live on the street, can you trust the police to come and say, oh, this guy's really had a few drinks, and let's take him and put him in a cell, and, um, and make sure that he sleeps it off, or are they going to start kicking him? We all have to make sure that the institution that is the police services in South Africa is not like the police services under apartheid. They don't kill people. What happened in, um, um, when the police found Mido uh, Masia uh, uh, parking his car illegally, his taxi illegally, instead of arresting him, taking him away, giving him a ticket or whatever it does, they dragged him behind the police car for 800 meters. You don't want that. If that sort of stuff continues in South Africa, then I'll start running. But the noise, the noise is just noise. Um, other institutions, the judiciary, if I've said anything to offend you today, are you going to, uh, can you sue me? Can you say I'm going to sue that guy? If you say that, you're saying, oh, the fact that I'm friends with some very, very, very powerful people like Jeremy Matt. Um, <laughs> the fact that I've got all these friends doesn't matter. Will Oscar Pistorius get a free, fair, independent time? All of us believe so. I believe so. So what does that mean? It means the judiciary works. But the minute you start believing, oh, you know, the judges won't, won't do anything against Justice Malala because, ooh, you know, he's on TV or something. That doesn't work. So those are the things, in my view, that need to work. The institutions need to work. We don't need to worry about the noise of politics. The noise, it will always be there. In five years, I'm telling you, there'll be 
there'll be another election in 2019, and what's going to happen? There's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. So when you hear people talk about, you know, the houses and so forth, and how, you know, they did some improvements on that house, and it's not a big house, and so forth. For me, always remember, there is one thing going on here. It's that the institution that may be the Department of Public Works, where you're going to put in your bid for some work in government, may be compromised. That's what you should be worrying about. But you know, the politicians are not going to worry about that too much. Because why? Of course, they want uh, the ANC's vote. So they're going to keep on saying, oh, it's terrible, that house, and so forth and so forth. <coughs> you must remember the other stuff. They will make the noise about, oh, it, it, the money must be paid back and so forth. And, and you know, it's fine. They, they must ask for that. It's what we do. It's politics. So go on and do it. But remember the institutions. Remember the institutions. Because when you and I don't want to do any work anymore, our kids are going to put in a tender in the very same department. And does it work? <coughs> that, the institutions are what I worry about. So when you see all that noise, just keep calm. It's fine. Just keep on doing business. I know for some of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> And I'm going to give you some of my views about what's happening in South Africa and what's going to happen over the next two years. Um, I just want to say, sometimes when you tell people in South Africa that, oh, we're going to have strikes in the next year or something, people think, oh, it's the end of the world. I want, I want us to stop thinking like that. In South Africa, we think a problem is the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It's just stuff that we need to fix. So let's fix it. So, you know, I want to remind you, in 1990, when Nelson Mandela walked out of jail, a lot of people bought a lot of... Uh, Chance, a lot of beans, put them under their beds and said, oh, it's the end of the world. South Africa is going to implode. Did it, did it implode? No. 1994, when we went to vote, I was a journalist at the Star. Remember, people, I didn't have to go to, there was so much violence in South Africa in the run up to the 94 election. I didn't have to go to Spokane, and Bantol, and other places where there was violence. Bombs were going off in the Jobek city center. People said, it's never going to happen. And here we are, in this room, 20 years later, and we are about to celebrate 20 years of freedom. And I think, you know, did the world end? No, it didn't end. I don't know if any of you like rugby, but you know, the Springboks were so rubbish before 1995. When the, the Springboks won the Rugby World Cup in 1995, I thought it was the end of the world. Just, you know, <laughs> um, 2010, people said, no, South Africa would never, ever, ever host the 2010 World Cup. And what happened? The Russians came, the Germans came, were they marked in the streets of Joburg? No. The world didn't end. I know South African women of the end of the world had come and they saw there's a man like this in South Africa. Actually, yes, there is a man like this. The world hasn't ended. So I'm going to tell you some, some stuff um, and I, I want you to take it in that spirit. The first thing is that, you know, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, oh, I want to sell South Africa this and sell South Africa this, I think you have to start thinking about the fact that South Africa is not just your market. The rest of the continent. The rest of the continent is going so phenomenally, and is so, it's going to be such a huge, huge market for all, all of us, for all our services. If you don't start thinking about, about the rest of the continent, then you will be left behind. Nigeria, I was studying, uh, I think, in the business day this morning, Nigeria is growing at 6% uh, GDP. We are growing at 1.9%. Think about that. Um, Mozambique, uh, more than 7%. Namibia. Um, Angola, the city of Luanda alone, its GDP is going at 24% per annum. You know, that, that, I mean, you go to Luanda and it's just cranes everywhere. People are building things, people are, it's an amazing, incredible African story. And what's happened there is that all over this continent, the wars are stopping, and what's happening? With democracy comes something incredible. People want to eat, people want to do business, and people are doing it. So if you think South Africa is your, is your market, I think you, you better start thinking otherwise. Um, if you look at the South African government, President Zuma goes to, the, to a country on the continent so often. Our lives are becoming more and more intertwined politically and in terms of trade and diplomatically that, that if you're thinking of South Africa, I think you're thinking smaller. You better start thinking uh, otherwise. And China is going to continue to be a big, big feature of our, of our lives. Um, if you think about it, many of you came from, let's say you came from Central, who would have thought there would be a China construction bank on, on Western Drive? Who would have thought there would be a Sino Steel building right there? Um, 
China, South Africa, I know, I know the many of the ladies here like the Barack Obama because he's so handsome and he speaks so well and all that. I'm sorry, the South African government has said, thank you very much, but our friends are China. And that is something that we all need to start factoring into your thinking. Many, many people in this room, also in business, sit there and say, oh, China is so terrible, they're going to do this to me and they're going to do that to me. You can do that. You can do that. But, but then you're not thinking strategically. You better start thinking, how do I um, harness the power that uh, China may have? How do I harness the skills or the manufacturing power that they have to enhance my business? But we have to think about it. You can't sit there and say, oh, you know, they're terrible, they're this, they're this. And that, unfortunately, many, many of us in South Africa still have those kind of, oh, you know, the foreigners this and the foreigners that. We don't have that. Um, on the rest of the continent, the Chinese are ubiquitous. They're doing business all over. Um, and so when you go and do business there, you will find that they're already there. Um, just in terms of Marigan, I do think that we all have to think very seriously about what's happened here. If you do a business in mining, for example, you'll realize that with a strike in the platinum sector, there's going to be unhappy sentiment about South Africa for a long while because people are saying, you guys are out on strike. Think about what's happening in the platinum belt right now. Nine weeks out on strike, 13 billion uh, uh, rent lost. Um, that is substantial. So if an investor is sitting somewhere um, in Canada or wherever and thinking, do I put my money in South Africa? They're going to think, well, I'm always available in Guinea or wherever else. So, you know, I think it's going to have an effect on, on all of us. And we need to think uh, quite a lot about that. I think you people in this room need to think a lot more about the relationship between government, business, and labor because I don't think it's working. Uh, if you look at our current situation, uh, the trade unions are going their own way, government is pulling one way and business is pulling the other. Many, many people uh, in government would look at business and say, you guys didn't say anything when those guys who build the stadiums, the construction companies, uh, colluded to do this and that and that and only got fired by the competition commission. Where was the voice of business when all that was, all that was happening? So I think, I think a, an institution like Netland I think people like yourself in this room, what business leaders need to start saying, if we don't all work together, um, that will all sink together. But I think that, that relationship is important. If you're going to vote, I want to tell you a big, big secret. President Zuma is going to win on this. You didn't have to call me in to know that. Um, the, only <laughs> the only party that President Juma has to worry about, despite the noise that you hear all over, uh, in my view, is the fact that the DA started at 1.7% as the DP in 1994. It's at 16.6% in 2009. I think it's the only party, it's the only party in the New South Africa that has grown. All the others, except the ANC grew and then started going down. All the others have gone. Down. So, in my view, the DA is the only party that really poses a challenge to the ANC. And I do think, despite the mistakes they have made around affirmative action, DEE and uh, the Ahad Manchat, they will continue to, uh, to, I think they'll go to above 20% in this election. I think our key problem in South Africa is this number. Uh, the South African economy grew by 1.9% last year. It means that you guys are not growing. It means that you guys cannot do anything um, to get to this young man and all the other young people of the street corners of this country to come and work for you. And that, that is, a, is a huge, huge challenge for South Africa. It is something that we have to fix and fix very, very quickly. Otherwise, we face, we face <coughs> terrible things. Um, if seven million people today, as you got up from your house and prepared to come here and, and listen and do deals and so forth, seven million people got up and they didn't have anywhere to go. It's a big problem for South Africa. And I think with the education system producing people who are not good enough to work for many of you, then we have a big problem here. And I think, I think that is why we see so many of these service delivery protests, because you have to ask yourself a question, why, uh, who are these people who are building up clinics and libraries and so forth? And you know, you think about the number of these protests. There are 32 every day in South Africa over the past six months. There's a problem. And if it continues, 
you can do business in this context, and that's a big, big problem. So that needs to be solved. And for me, education, unemployment, this is what our government needs to, to really deal with. And, uh, and we can do with that if we adopt the National Development Plan, written by these two young men here who led it. Um, uh, we just have to implement it. But in South Africa, unfortunately, we have lots of nice, very nice, thick plans. It's 480 pages if you want to read that. You can also read that with a public protector's report, which is also 480 pages. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know if you'll do any business, but it's a time. So I think we have a plan, and I think the NDP is that plan. I think it will be fantastic. Just some happy news for all of you. There's a lot of money coming into the system. Um, the ANC says in its manifesto, and the South African government, if you uh, look at Alvin uh, Gordon's budget, the South African government is going, is going to spend a, 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 a four trillion rand in, in uh, infrastructure development over the next 15 years. So, you know, what does government want you to do? It wants you to bring your skills, to bring your expertise, and, um, and you can get a piece of that nice, big cake. Yeah. And it's long term, it's 15 years of spend. So, you know, if you see a, a lot of people, uh, many of you, I'm sure, hit that pothole on your way here. You shouldn't complain when you see that pothole. And stop singing, ah, infrastructure, I'm going to fix that. <laughs> because the money is there. Um, and government wants to spend it. Uh, and government doesn't fix potholes. They want people like yourself to fix those potholes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really what I'm, I, I'm, I came to talk to you about. I, I hope you have a good conference. I, I just want to say, when someone like me stands up and says some of the things I've said about whether it's Maricana, politics and so forth, some of it is very nice, some of it is challenging and it's all so forth. I just want to remind you that you guys have done an incredible job here in South Africa. You could be living in, in Angola. In Angola, the president has been in power since 1979. You could be living in Italy, where Silvio Berlusconi has been in power on and off since 1992, and he's busy fighting right now to become prime minister again. You could be living in Zimbabwe, where one guy has been the selfless guy in the room since 1980. Uh, you could have lived in, uh, in Libya, where one guy was in power from 1969 to 2011 for 42 years. And you guys here in South Africa, you gave us Nelson Mandela, one term, five years, and he said goodbye. <coughs> Tabu Bey, in his second term, the ANC says, look, my father, it's time for you to go. He doesn't say, oh, it's a coup d'etat, it's over, it's terrible. He says, guys, the ANC put me here. We run a party system in South Africa. They've asked me to come back. He goes on television at 7 p.m. on a Sunday, says, I've been a member of the ANC for 52 years. Thank you very much. The ANC has asked me to come back home and he leaves. This guy comes in, he's got eight months in the job. You know what it's like when he's only got eight months. You want to fire someone. <laughs> <laughs> so he just sits there. And, uh, and uh, in 2009, uh, does he say, oh no, you can't be changing presidents all the time. President Zuma wins the election. And he says, President Zuma, there it is. And we've had President Zuma for five years now. And, um, you know, who knows? You guys might elect him in, you might not elect him in. It's up to you. But in just 20 years of the new South Africa, we've had four presidents. And I think that says something. It says your kids know that you change people at the top. My kids know that we change people at the top. Next thing you know, we'll be changing political parties, and it will be OK. It's a democracy. It's a problem. One day we'll be like the Ghanaians who change, you know, parties at the election. And it's a fantastic country. It's growing at 8%. And uh, it's great. So I think South Africa is, uh, is still working. I think that it's a great place to do business. We need to fix the economy and so forth. But I think the institutions like this one are holding. If you think about many of you here are in government, if you think about the former Auditor General Transman member, a fantastic, <coughs> fantastic institution. You think about uh, Tivi Madonsela, a fantastic, fantastic institution. So, if you were to ask me where am I, I think that glass is towards full rather than uh, empty. So, I still think that uh, what the FT said about you guys, that uh, we're going to be a fantastic country, is absolutely true. Thanks so much.